With all the concerns emerging regarding sweeteners or sugar substitutes, one alternative that has been gaining a lot of traction is allulose. It seems it doesn't have the same baggage or red flags that other sweeteners do, like disruption of the microbiome or associated weight gain or worsening of metabolic health. While it does seem to have pretty amazing benefits when it comes to diabetes and weight loss, but is that actually the case? And does the most recent evidence support it? More importantly, are there any safety concerns that have emerged now that more people are using it? Well, in this video, I'll give you the latest evidence regarding the effects of allulose on your health, focusing on recent trials done in humans, which is important since much of the hype surrounding allulose was based on animal studies done in rats and mice. I will also talk to you about important safety considerations regarding allulose and discuss scenarios in which you may reconsider using it. And at the end of the video, I'll give you my favorite alternative if you decide that allulose is not for you. Hi, I'm Dr. Leonid Kim. I am board certified in internal and obesity medicine. And on this channel, I discuss the most up-to-date and evidence-based information on the topics of weight loss, metabolic health, and longevity. Let's get into it. Allulose has quickly become one of the favorite sweeteners, especially in the low carb community over the past few years. And man, there's a lot to like about it. First, allulose itself is real sugar, classified as a rare sugar that's found naturally in small quantities in foods like raisins, figs, and maple syrup. So it actually tastes like sugar. Well, it's about 70% as sweet as sucrose or your regular table sugar, but it doesn't have the weird chemical aftertaste that you get with sweeteners like aspartame or Splenda. And it is almost fully absorbed in the small intestine. So it doesn't give you the GI side effects like nausea, bloating, and diarrhea that you get with alcohol sugars like xylitol and erythritol, unless you're consuming large doses but more on that a little later. Now, once it's absorbed through the GI tract, close to 90% of it is excreted by the kidneys without being converted into energy. So though technically it is a carbohydrate, because of how allulose is metabolized, or actually not metabolized by our bodies, the FDA stopped labeling it as an added sugar in 2019. And because of these properties, allulose does not raise your blood sugar. It counts for negligible calories and carbs utilized, and in fact, Data from animal studies noted benefits like improving insulin resistance, delaying onset of type 2 diabetes, and lowering the glycemic index of other carbohydrates. All that sounds exciting, but it's hard to draw any conclusions based on animal studies, so I'm glad we're finally starting to see studies done in humans. First, one meta-analysis published in Clinical Nutrition in 2020 looked at 40 trials encompassing about 400 subjects in total and found that small doses of allulose can actually lower the glycemic index or postprandial glucose after ingesting other carbohydrates. So not only does allulose not raise your blood sugar itself, it actually helps to lower the blood sugar and insulin when consumed with other carbohydrates. And that certainly makes sense since allulose is excreted by the kidneys and in the process, it pulls additional glucose out of the body and into the urine. Another study published in the British Medical Journal last year was a small, but a prospect of double-blind randomized crossover study that looked at 30 subjects without diabetes and found that given allulose along with a 50 gram sugar dose, reduced postprandial plasma glucose and insulin levels compared to placebo. And another small study published last month looked at postprandial hyperglycemia after break of fasting during Ramadan and noted that the addition of allulose before iftar improved glucose in the target range and lower excursions of glucose outside the target range. And finally, a randomized control study in 2018 looked at 121 Korean subjects and found that supplementation with allulose significantly decreased body fat percentage and abdominal fat mass measured by CT scans when compared to the placebo group. As you can see, as we're moving beyond animal studies and into small human trials, the benefits of allulose are still holding up, and using allulose has noticeable effects on blood sugar levels and fat mass reduction. Now you may be thinking, what's the catch? Is it really the holy grail of sweeteners? Well, the biggest downside of allulose is the lack of studies regarding a safety profile, and the human studies which is discussed are promising but still very small or based on observational data. But 
enough information is accumulated to where you can start making an informed decision on whether allulose is right for you. Now, when it comes to safety, the FDA labeled allulose as generally recognized as safe in 2012, meaning it's considered safe by experts under the conditions of its intended use. A study published in Fundamental Toxicological Sciences in 2019 noted that a 12-week continuous ingestion of allulose in borderline diabetes and type 2 diabetes did not show any clinical problems and actually show some improvement in hepatic function. Another study that looked at the side effect profile of allulose noted that it's generally well tolerated until reaching the dose of 0.4 grams per kilogram of body weight, at which point people start developing GI symptoms like nausea and diarrhea. So for example, a 70 kilogram or 154 pound person can consume up to 28 grams of allulose before starting to feel any GI upset. Now, individual results may vary, and some will get GI upset even at lower doses, but most people usually don't come close to reaching that limit if using it for coffee or tea. However, you may have to be careful if you're using allulose for cooking and have to use larger quantities. And finally, there's one group of people that I think may need to be a little bit more careful when switching to allulose and it's people who get frequent urinary tract infections. Since allulose is excreted in your urine, and as we discussed, actually pulls extra sugar out of your body and into your urine, it resembles the mechanism of action of a diabetes drug class called SGL2 inhibitors. So drugs like Farziga, Jardians, or Invacana, which also works for getting rid of glucose through the urine. This class of drugs has some reports suggesting they may be associated with UTIs, so the FDA has required SGL2 inhibitors to include a warning about a risk for severe UTIs. Now, does that mean if you have issues with UTIs, then you shouldn't take allulose? Well, I do think it's still safe to take allulose for a couple of reasons. First, the amount of glucose excreted with allulose is just a small fraction of what you see while taking SGL2 inhibitor. Second, Subsequent studies monitoring the safety of SGL2 inhibitors have not shown an increased risk of UTIs. There is also no evidence that those drugs cause increased risk of bladder cancers, which is also a concern that was raised with these drugs and allulose. But as I said before, everyone is different, and if you do notice increased UTIs or yeast infections after switching to allulose, I would stop and see if allulose was the reason. Lastly, a paper in the British Journal of Nutrition raised concern that consumption of allulose may result in an overgrowth of a bacteria called Klebsiella pneumoniae, as it is one of the few bacteria that can actually utilize allulose as a substrate. The concern is that even though Klebsiella pneumoniae is part of the normal flora of the mouth, skin, and the intestines, it can cause serious infections in people with weakened immune system and lung disease, especially if this bacteria is allowed to overgrow, which can theoretically happen with allulose. Now, I personally do not think it's anything to be worried about unless more robust studies corroborate such concerns, as all of this is based on in vitro studies, so only seen in the test tube or a petri dish, and not even animal and let alone human studies. Overall, I really do not see any significant concerns with allulose and would actually recommend it over any other sweetener on the market today, with the only caveat being a little close monitoring if you had issues with frequent urinary tract infections or if you develop GI symptoms even at lower doses. Now, if you decide that allulose is not for you, then the next best alternative I would recommend is monk fruit, which also has promising animal studies. However, it's often sold combined with other sweeteners, so it may be a little tricky to find it as an extract by itself. This video is already getting a little too long, so if you'd like for me to review the evidence behind monk fruit, let me know in the comments below. I hope this video was helpful and provided a little bit of clarity in the confusing world of sweeteners and sugar substitutes. I'll see you in the next one.